Long ago, when I was a young boy, when I was a young boy, during Christmas in 2001, I was furiously unwrapping my gifts. As I tore through the wrapping paper, tissues, and cards, one of my last gifts from good old Saint Nick was an original Xbox. The glorious machine was plugged in and set up immediately. We were fresh off the heels of our N64 and were always looking for new gaming experiences. Some things never change. Since upon release, there weren't many games, let alone those that came with the system. At first, it was slim pickings for games, before the mod chip came along. But there was always this one game that stuck out to me. I can't remember if it came with the console or if it was another gift that faithful Christmas. That game was Oddworld Munch's Odyssey. Join me on my journey and non-linear experience across the Oddworld universe, starting with the amazing title I enjoyed all those years ago. Warning, spoilers for all games ahead. I loved this game. I was immediately drawn into the completely unique and abstract world. Not to mention, the cover art of the game had already pulled me in, looking like a sweaty can of succulent Mountain Dew. Coca-Cola! <laughs> Mountain Dew! I had never seen anything like it before. I would usually just naively play along, taking in the sights, indulging myself in the universe of Oddworld. But I always had this nagging question, who is this guy you start out as, Abe? I knew who Munch was, as the intro cutscene introduces him pretty well. He's the last Gabbit, of course. But this Abe guy and the Mudokins, I had no clue who they were. That was until I realized there's a backstory button before starting a new game that totally reveals and spoils the previous games in the franchise. Since I had no clue there were other games and I wasn't going to get a PlayStation anytime soon, I took the plunge. I'm not so sure about that. Come on, Abe! You wanna kick that jabbit and save your brothers or not? Well, yeah, but don't you think that's way too high? Looks fine to us. Piece of cake, Abe. You just gotta jump in. But that's a kinda scary well. Nothing we all can't handle. Come on, Abe. We're right behind you. Right behind, right behind, you, behind you. you, baby. You promise? Promise, Abe. Now go before it's too late. Mm. Uh. Okay. Here goes. <laughs> I was finally introduced to Abe properly, and I only got more and more into the world. So I continued to play. I was determined to beat the game. The character Munch was so endearing as you quickly learn of his plight, and I was connected to Abe now that I was aware of the narrative and exactly what was at stake here. Even the themes of the game struck a chord with my young impressionable mind as I worked through the game to stick it to the corporations and the gluckins that used them as tools for control. The gameplay itself was relatively new and boundary pushing for its time as well, but I hadn't played a platformer yet where you operate two very different characters. Banjo and Kazooie operated as a single unit, but Abe and Munch are separate entities and you need to use their unique skills to accomplish tasks and complete puzzles throughout the game. It was really clever and to me groundbreaking. The game could be pretty janky at times however, whether it was controlling the characters, especially while sprinting, or tossing mudokins and bombs accurately. It could be a real lesson in patience trying to get the stars to align just to toss Munch over a wall. Even though it can detract from the game a little, it was pretty easy to get used to, and by the end, you'll have adapted to the weird and sensitive controls to muscle memory. As I pursued the sweet completion, I couldn't help but be fully immersed in the world. The character design and world building are just incredible, and for a young, impressionable mind, I was in complete awe. It was so mysterious seeing Abe's mouth stitches or Munch's odd single frog foot design. The term Oddworld really fits this universe and everything was slowly coming together. The character and art style was so strange, so alien, yet at the same time so endearing, and there's no resisting its charm as you become attached to both Abe and Munch. Each of the characters' skills can be kind of extrapolated from their design. 
Even if you didn't watch the opening cutscene, you can tell that Munch is going to be good at swimming, and the level design introduces you slowly and individually to the skill sets that each character is bringing to the table. Munch is able to free fuzzles, swim, control robots, and zap enemies, while Abe is capable of communicating with Mudokins, punching, and possessing enemy targets. You actually start off with Abe, and as you communicate with the Shaman and other Mudokins, it becomes more than clear that he is some sort of leader or prophet as he stands out among the crowds of his people, much like the Shaman. Continuing through the game, you can't help but fall in love with the level design. For the time, it was quite top-notch, combining both narrative quality with good gameplay and complicated puzzles. It was a match made in heaven, and it was obvious the developers really used the technology of the original Xbox to pull off their grand feat. While the 3D design has aged well, it can feel empty at times, and sometimes Munch's Odyssey fails to capture the game's atmosphere. The game really instills this domineering feeling that comes from the Gluckin's grip on the planet and its various inhabitants. It does this through world building. Don't get me wrong, the cutscenes obviously contribute to the atmosphere of the game and push the narrative, but the level design has a lot to do with it as well. Slogging through the slog huts and crawling through Viker's lab in pursuit of the last can of Gaviar proves to be such an immersive experience. The game still holds up to this day, while only becoming ever slightly more boring as the game progresses. This is due to the fact that for the length of the game, the puzzles have a hard time being variable and complicated enough toward the end. This doesn't detract too much from the experience though, as I drew ever closer to completing the game, I was unaware of the fact that the game has two endings, and upon my first completion, I of course got the bad ending, having less than 50% Quarma. So the puzzles ended up turning on me, killing Abe, and Munch ending up dying to the Vikers, extracting his lungs for the Glocking Queen. It's an incredibly sad end to an already long enough game. I was pissed, but this didn't deter me, for no sooner than I was finished, I was off to the races again, rockying my way to the top. This time, I made sure to save the vast majority of the Mundakins and Fuzzles, enabling me to get the good ending. It put a smile on my face and a tear to my eye seeing Abe and Munch finally succeed in their quest. The Gabbits were saved and Viker's lab was destroyed. All was good under the sun. However, I couldn't help but shake the itch for more, and because there isn't much replayability in Munch's Odyssey, I had to look elsewhere to satisfy my craving. Thankfully, I didn't have to wait too long before Oddworld Stranger's Wrath was released in 2005. This game blew my mind back then, but now I've been playing through the game with the HD edition and the controls are completely borked. They can be fixed with some slight tweaking, but initially there's something else. If I wasn't already obsessed with the Oddworld universe after Munch's Odyssey, this was the game that really sealed the deal for me. The more western influenced setting, the amazing character of Stranger, and the always awesome, while wildly strange, Oddworld really packs a punch this time around. While it represents a great departure for the developers, everything that makes Oddworld great is still there, and the game quickly became and remains my favorite Oddworld experience. It was around this time that I also became more interested in learning and experiencing the first two games. It really felt like this franchise or property was going somewhere, and Lorne Lanning, the creator, was really treating this series like his baby, delivering, often out of nowhere, incredible gaming experiences and works of art. This fourth game in the series thrusts you into the titular character Stranger as he travels the western wastes working as a bounty hunter to pay for some mysterious surgery. Oh my, paying for this? You're supposed to be the big badass bounty hunter! Figure it out! In typical Oddworld fashion, the game wastes no time in introducing the player to new species and characters within the established universe. There's new kinds of critters like thud slugs and chip punks, and other sentient species like clackers and steef. All in all, there are 15 new species introduced to the Oddworld universe. Stranger's Wrath really felt like a perfect follow-up to Munch's Odyssey even though it could be quite different. 
In all honesty, outside of the art style and narrative and universe, it is a huge deviation from the past few games, especially the first two as they were 2D platforms. This was a welcome deviation however as the combination between first person and third person works so well here and is incredibly smooth. Speaking of first person, the game introduced a whole new kind of weapon never before seen in gaming, Stranger's Crossbow. I know, it's just a crossbow and at first glance it's nothing new, but players quickly realize this bow isn't shooting no mundane arrows. Instead, it fires various live ammo, critters and crawlies, all with differing abilities to dispatch enemies, solve puzzles, and simply just feel amazing. I had never seen a weapon quite like this in gaming, until this point, and as I try to think back, I can't remember any other experience that was exactly like this. Branching from the weapons and ammunition, you have collecting mechanics. All ammunition is of course finite, and the player will find themselves collecting these various critters from the game world. They are located around their nests, which all reflect the different species of ammo. You can find bolomites wandering from web to web, or boom bats flying from nest to nest. It works as a pretty interesting mechanic and helps the style of this game really shine. There was no game like Stranger's Wrath at the time, and so much like Munch's Odyssey, I was on a quest for completion. As I took command of Stranger, I went off collecting bounty after bounty, pursuing that coveted moolah to afford the strange surgery he required. The story progression is incredibly linear here, as all the old world games tend to be, but the world building and characters kept me engaged and on the edge of my seat with anticipation for what was to come next. It's actually a clever way to push the narrative, having the player go after bounty after bounty as the story unfolds around them. The bounties themselves offer some really fun gameplay too while they're at it. All bounties have a pathway scattered with enemies leading up to them, and then the big fight always plays out in an arena. Some bosses require Stranger to take specific actions to see their demise, and every encounter offers the player with some agency as they decide whether to take the bounty dead or alive. Some bounties definitely stand out more than others here though, and that's okay because these standout fights are fantastic. At some point or another, it's outed that, like our previous game's protagonist, Munch, Stranger is the last of a species known as the Steef. Furthermore, like Munch, he's being hunted to extinction by an octagy named Secto, who runs a bottled water facility in the region of Western Mudos. Again, just like in the past entries into the series, Stranger's Wrath proves itself a solid addition to the interesting, vast, and creative world. All the humor, anti-corporatism, and western tropes are here, and the themes constantly work to provide legitimacy to the narrative. I'm after Palooka. I needs to get in the junkyard. Palooka, huh? Well, to get that two-timing punk, you're gonna need a password. The password is... <laughs> well, did you just say... Yep, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Get that double crossing, jackass. Once Stranger is revealed to be the Steve, he has no choice but to take out all of his pursuers, which is basically everyone, even the greedy clackers, now that they're aware of Stranger's true nature. He pushes forward, taking out bandit after bandit on his quest to Secto's Dam to remove Oddworld of the scourge that seeks him. Unlike the other games in the franchise, Stranger's Wrath has only one ending, and it's for the better, I believe, because it gives positive closure to the narrative, regardless of the player's performance, so everyone can get a full image of the game upon their first completion. Stranger engages Secto, taking out his Glocktigy bodyguards, then the man himself, who upon his defeat is revealed to be another Steve. While the real Secto escapes into the water, his future plans clearly foreshadowed, but as of yet unknown, the fellow Steve shares some words with Stranger as he passes peacefully. Overall, the Stranger's Wrath experience was among my top 5 for the entirety of the Xbox console, and I played a lot of Xbox games. Thankfully, like all the games in the Oddworld series, it has also been remastered for the PC, and so humbly sits in my Steam collection. After finishing Stranger's Wrath, I couldn't help but feel the same way I did when I finished Munch's Odyssey. There was a void in my heart only Oddworld could fill. 
Unfortunately, it was around this time that we would see the longest gap between releases within the Oddworld universe, and it seemed that the fate of the franchise remained in limbo. Now was the perfect time to get into the first two games, Abe's Odyssey and Abe's Exodus. However, I had little desire to, as I felt the games were starting to show their age, and I had the whole synopsis spoiled for me by the backstory of Munch's Odyssey. So it was back to the waiting game for me. This may have proven to be foolish of me though, as the first two games are true gems for the PlayStation library. The gameplay for the time was top notch for a 2D platformer, and the art style really stood out amongst its contemporaries. The universe of Oddworld would also be established in these first two games, and it would prove to resonate with gamers and critics alike, as the games would both see critical and commercial success. Of course they did, otherwise we wouldn't have gotten A Stranger's Wrath or Munch's Odyssey. After a while from release of the fourth game, it was revealed in 2010 that Oddworld Inhabitants, the publishers and developers, had been working with Just Add Water to remaster and port all the games to the PC, and then afterward would show off what they had been working on for the next addition to the series, Oddworld New and Tasty. New and Tasty would be shown to be a remake of the first game, Abe's Odyssey. The studio had remade the game from the ground up and completely transformed the experience. It really is a new game that, while it's definitely an upgrade, can't be compared fairly to the original experience. Finally, a game came along to satiate my Oddworld addiction. I jumped right into the game, elated that I get to experience a modern retelling of a game I opted to skip, like a spoiled child. It was no matter though, as this game is more than faithful to its source material. The retelling of Abe's journey is an incredible experience that brings back all the beloved features of the Oddworld universe, just as it should. I don't have much to comment on this game, like its predecessors, but it truly is the definitive introduction to Oddworld. The graphics are stunning, and I think the art style is the best it's ever been in the franchise. Some would disagree, but I believe it really dials home the atmosphere and depravity of Abe's situation, all the while making the characters stand out and represent themselves in intriguing ways. For example, the Mudokins and Abe are clearly meek, naive, and innocent, while the Gluckins and Sligs exemplify exploitation, greed, and industry. The puzzles in the game are second to none as well. Now, I suck at 2D platformers, let alone 2D platformers with puzzles. This game was a real toughie for me, and I really struggled in most sections. Even the most mundane of puzzles would constantly prove to be trouble for me. Some of these puzzles are incredibly difficult and have had me squeezing the controller in frustration or screaming at my monitors all the same. The player gets reacquainted with Abe after not seeing him for over 10 years aside from the remasters. It was a real charming experience seeing the new art style and graphics while scrambling all over Rupture Farms trying to save as many Mudokins as I could. Many argue, however, that the game is too much unlike the original, and in the process of modernizing the old title, too much was lost in capturing the original look and feel of the game. I can sympathize with these critiques, but I definitely disagree. Even though I didn't play the first two games when they were timely, I wholeheartedly believe that Just Add Water really excelled in bringing Abe's Odyssey to modern audiences and quality. Regardless of its detractions, the game would go on to be a commercial and critical success, and would give the studio some much needed compensation for their work over the years in bringing these amazing experiences to gaming. All of these amazing experiences bring us to Oddworld Inhabitants' latest gaming endeavor, Oddworld Soulstorm. This game, like the release that came before it, is another remake. I wasn't totally keen on the studio doing another remake, but considering how well done New and Tasty was, I would happily take another dose of Oddworld Gaming. But truth be told, I really wanted a whole new experience within the universe, even if it was just a spin-off like Stranger's Wrath and not part of the Quintology, I would have been happy. Alas, the game would be teased and announced in 2016, but it would not see release until 2021. A year before release, the studio posted a message to their Twitter regarding big news about the PC version. The big news was that Oddworld Soulstorm was slated to be an Epic Game Store exclusive. Oh, 
Anderson for what the inaugural address. What a great honor to be able to introduce for the first time ever. My jaw dropped, my mind was blown, and I was pissed. I can't stand the Epic Games Store personally, and I have completely refused to buy any games releasing on their platform. This was apparently all about the change. I would end up biting the bullet recently after getting motivation to do this video, and the game shall remain my only purchase in the store. The silver lining here is that the studio, specifically Lorne Lanning, were incredibly transparent about their plans and justification for such. It's an admirable quality to be so clear-cut in an industry so filled with secrecy, lies, and deception. However, it seemed odd that a studio so against corporatism, greed, and exploitation would make an exclusivity agreement with Epic Games. I mean, there's a number of other ways they could have financed the game, a shining example being crowdfunding. My complaints about the release aside, the game is actually really good. Our World Soulstorm is quite the ambitious game, bringing in inventory wheels, crafting, and looting, and of course, all the classic mechanics and skills from previous entries. The game is a standout addition to the Oddworld universe, and of course, it's so endearing once again to take control of Abe as he launches a quest to free more Mudokins, all the while taking up the Soulstorm Brewery. The original story is still very much intact, and the game uses cutscenes, much like previous games, to really push its narrative. And boy, do these cutscenes look amazing! Building on from the graphical updates that New and Tasty brought, the new development team excels in updating the look and feel of its predecessor, all the while capturing the original charm, urgency, and storyline. This is yet another example of a remake done right. To this day, the Oddworld universe remains one of the most time-tested classics in gaming. The characters, the world, the themes, and the atmosphere all pack an absolute punch. Through every experience I had with the franchise, I had been totally gripped and hooked. I could not get enough of Abe, Munch's, or Stranger's journey, and I felt compelled to see all of their missions to completion. My relationship with the series began out of order with Munch's Odyssey. Being the game that introduced me to this seller series, I found it incredibly charming. From the way its characters talked, to the design of the Mudokins, I was instantly a huge fanboy. After seeing Munch's quest to its conclusion, with Viker Labs destroyed, I moved on to Stranger's Wrath. This is where my heart for the series really lies. I still have not played a game that is quite like Stranger's Wrath. There's of course other westerns and such, like Red Dead, but Stranger's Wrath does so much unique to really establish itself as an individual. It's my favorite game in the series and would definitely prove to be a high point for the franchise. Unfortunately, this is also where we would see the end of standalone features within the Oddworld universe, and all subsequent releases would be remasters or remakes of the first two games. After all the games had been remastered and ported to the PC, Oddworld Inhabitants teamed up with Just Add Water for their next release, New and Tasty. This entry to the series would prove to be a complete remake of the first game. It doesn't introduce much, but the game does look stunning and really updates the experience. Following the release of New and Tasty, there would be another content drought in regards to Oddworld. It was announced in 2016 that the developers were working with a new studio to follow up New and Tasty. This next game would be another remake, this time of the second game, Abe's Exodus. Oddworld Soulstorm was released in 2021, and if New and Tasty was a big upgrade, this one is even greater. The graphics and visuals are a lot more improved from the past game. The problem with the game, however, is that it was an Epic Game Store exclusive. Overall, my experience with the Oddworld universe has been some of the best in gaming. For me, it's mostly the art style, narrative, and characters that keep me coming back, but every entry to the franchise also offers amazing gameplay. Thank you for watching and joining me on this non-sequential journey through the Oddworld series. Let me know what your experience is with Oddworld and what's your favorite game down in the comments. Until the next time, play some Oddworld and take care.